Hi, I'm Dave. And I'm Paul. And we're going to challenge you to transform your financial future through the principles of the most profitable business in the world, banking. We believe everyone should be involved in two businesses, the business that you're in and the banking business. Everyday people can replicate what bankers have been doing for centuries to leverage capital and build wealth through private lending. Join us as we uncover the truths about money, expose lies and myths, and flip conventional financial advice on its head. Here we go. Hey, Paul. Back for another one. Yeah, man. How you doing? I'm good, man. I, you know, this is, we're recording this the day after the Super Bowl. So pretty pumped. My Chiefs won the Super Bowl. I'm not a bandwagon fan. I've been, that's where I was born and raised. So good to see them win again. That was a pretty, pretty awesome game to watch. Yeah, the game was great. The commercials, mediocre at best for the most part. I think they were better than most years, though. Really? Yeah, maybe because I don't have any expectations anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, the halftime show. Yeah. yeah. I posted about it, obviously, and people were like, what What did you think was wrong with it? I'm like, if you have to ask, then we're not I, on the same level as far as our music, um, uh, our music tastes. It was gross, man. I turned it off. I gave it, like, the you know, a couple minutes, maybe one song, and then I turned it off. I just I flipped it up to, you know, some other TV show for about 10 minutes. I just, I can't stand it. Yeah. I, and I couldn't, couldn't take it. I'm a, I'm a music fan, you know, I like, um, I'm a big, you know, oldies, 60s, 50s, I like classic rock, I like, you know, a lot of the older stuff, I love the 80s, and, and it kind of, t- in my, you know, tails off into the 90s, and I, I just don't think music today is, I think it's garbage, and that was, that was typical of today, that was, that was garbage, you disagree, that's fine, I don't care what you think, it's, it was garbage. I mean, I'm less opposed to the music than I was to the dancing. So as soon as the, the dancing just gets like that, like I got kids, they don't need to watch that. Remember, yeah. like, uh, I think it was during the 2018 Super Bowl, Beyonce uh, dancing. And it was like, I mean, it was like a strip show, you know? Yeah, I'm and not going to let kids my kids that know, watch these shows. That's right. You know, my children were sitting there and I said, you want to know what's wrong with America? <laughs> take a <laughs> take a quick look. There you go. There you yeah. Go. Well, at least they didn't watch the Grammys. Yeah. What's yeah. that? Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Well, so that was that was awesome. And then uh, today, in about I don't know, probably an hour, when Bo gets home from school, we're gonna go sh- shoot guns. Oh, sweet! So, yeah, head down to the gun indoors. Range. I'm assuming. Yeah. Yep. Although it'd be nice to be outdoors. It's 40 and sunny today in yeah. Minnesota. So beautiful wow. day. Yeah. Awesome. Well, all right, man. Uh, I think we we were talking before this. We had a couple questions that came in that were pretty similar. Uh, actually, like five minutes before we got on here and started recording, I got a text from a client who said, um, I'll just read it. He's, uh, and this is not atypical. It's a pretty common question from, from people, but he said, Hey Dave, my truck is in the shop and the bill is $2,100. Would it make more sense to use a policy loan or just pay the bill with the cash I have? So my response, and I haven't responded to him yet. I'm going to, is going to be in the form of a question. Like first, have you fully funded your premium for the year? Is there any PUA that you can add to your policy right now? Yes or no? If so, no, you put the $2,100 towards the PUA. And then if you need to take a loan, you do that. Yep. So that's, that's number one. Have you funded your premium fully? Yeah, perfect. That's perfect question to ask. And I concur. Yep. And then the, you know, the next question, if, if yes, you know, if, premium is fully funded, there's nothing else you can put in there for the year, then do you need that $2,100 to, to pay bills this month or to feed your family? Uh, because if so, then that's what you need it for. And that's what it was earmarked for anyway. Your cash value is now your emergency savings. And that's where that, you know, that unexpected bill for a truck breaking down comes from your, your right. cash value account. So what's he yeah. doing? Transmission or something? I don't even know. Who knows? Uh, he must not have a Dodge Ram <laughs> or it wouldn't be in the shop. No, I'm kidding. He might have a Dodge Ram. I don't know. Yeah. It's probably a general motors. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not much of a car guy anyway. Right. Yeah. So yeah, you know, I don't know if there's anything else. And I would ask instead of just responding to the question with an answer, because you know, which which wouldn't be very smart on my part anyway, because I don't know his situation. That's right. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's a client of mine. We just did his policy not too long ago, but I don't know exactly what's going on 
in his life financially. Um, so, you know, plus you gotta, you gotta teach people to be their own banker. Um, yeah. And I think from a, a becoming your own banker standpoint, now looking through that lens, you, you, you're going to handle it perfectly. Yeah. And then the, the final question to ask, and it's more of a rhetorical question, but why are you saving money in somebody else's bank still? You know, that's right. Why isn't that going towards premium anyway? Yeah. Of course, this is his first policy. So, you know, you shouldn't be putting it all towards premium anyway. Um, not at this point, but eventually if, if he comes back to me and he's like, Hey Dave, I want to buy a new car, uh, a new truck, $30,000. Should I take a loan or pay with the cash I have in checking? My first question is going to be, why do you have $30,000 in checking? And, yep, and premium. not in your premiums too small. Right. Exactly. So different questions for different times. That's right. Yeah. And then you had one. Did you want to share that? Yeah, I'll share this one. It's it's on a similar similar lines of policy. It's a, just kind of a generic policy loan question, but um, this is a shared client of ours, and it's a pretty simple question. What should my policy loan repayment be if I do X? If I want to do X with this cash value, and I'll give a, a fairly generic answer. But let's say we're doing um, like a debt snowball type scenario where I'm going to eliminate some sort of debt. And that debt currently costs me $500 a month of cash flow that's leaving my personal economy every month and I'm sending it to the credit card company or the finance company for the truck or whatever. If I take a policy loan because I have that money in cash value inside my system and eliminate that debt, my new that, that $500 in this case has to go back towards, should go back towards repaying that policy loan. So he was wondering basically what it, what his payment should be. And that's basically what I told him. I was like, hey, if you're eliminating this debt, that whatever that was costing you, now that becomes the policy loan repayment. Right. right? Because you're just redirect, you're just kind of trading out debt at this point. Um, and he, he, he liked that answer. And of course, from an IBC perspective, you can do whatever payment schedule and payment amount you want to, right? If right. it's monthly, great. If it's twice per month, wonderful. If it's every quarter, great. But you're the banker, right? Do what works for you in this in this you know particular situation. Yeah, and like you said, you're the banker. You're not the customer anymore. You're the banker. So if it's your bank, would you want to be repaying it? You know, three hundred dollars a month or the full five hundred. You know, Nelson would say, make it 550. So That's repay right. it even quicker than you were paying somebody else's bank. Like it doesn't make any sense to, to be okay paying somebody else's bank 500, but then you're redirecting that money and say, no, nah, I'm only gonna pay my bank 300 bucks. That's stealing the peas. That's right, we're not gonna steal the peas. If you don't know what that is, you need to go read Becoming Your Own Banker by Nelson right. Nash. Yeah, so good. So that kind of leads into really what we want to discuss again uh, today. You were talking about the different, you know, you want to pay back a couple times a month, weekly, monthly, quarterly, whatever you want. You're the banker. You get to make the rules. Um, well, let's talk about premium payments. Uh, that's It's not really something we discuss, but it's something that comes up every, you no, know, anytime we're working with somebody, you have to decide in the first year, how do you want to pay this premium? Uh, I think in both of our experiences, I'd say, I'd say 80 to 85% of my clients pay annually because they've been saving the money somewhere or they just, you know, came into a, a big chunk of money selling uh, an asset um, or they, uh, they're, they're liquidating something else, right? So they got a big chunk of money they want to move somewhere. So they're able to pay annually. Uh, so let's talk about the different payment options. What are they? Yeah, so you just said the best one, the most efficient uh, premium um, mode is annual, right? Uh, there's four different kinds. The next one I would say that's the most common, Dave, is monthly. Mm -hmm. um, but there's going to be a slight, there's an upcharge for that, isn't there, compared, yep. to, compared to annual. Right. Um, but again, I think as we talk through these, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, let me just say this generically. I think you're going to start where you're at, folks. And we've got a couple of clients that pay quarterly. That was, uh, personally, that was my first set of clients that paid quarterly. I was like, hey, great. Um, you're going to start where you're at. But the goal, I think, over the long term, doesn't have to be, but it should be, let's try to make 
that transition into annual premium payers mm -hmm. just because it's going to make you that much more efficient. Right. And you only have to remember to pay premium, you know, once per year. Right, which actually is one of the disadvantages of paying quarterly or semi-annually. If you pay annually, that's easy. You make one payment a year. It's like, a you know, you get, you yep. get the invoice in the mail. You I know where you're check. going. Yeah. If you pay monthly, it has to be automatic drafts. That's right. So you don't even think about it, right? It just yep. comes out. But what about quarterly? <laughs> they got to remember. You have to remember, man. Like every three months, I've got reminders on my in my CRM. You know, I've only got one client paying quarterly, but I've got a reminder in there like a couple of weeks before that quarterly payment comes due. I get a reminder that says, remind so-and-so quarterly payments coming up. Because, you know, if he doesn't remember, he's still got a grace period in there. But then, right. you know, you get that that email. It's like, you're 21 days overdue. Grace period's 30 days. Then you're scrambling. You no, know? right. So we don't want that. So yeah, you got to remember that on your own. Set up, court, you know, calendar reminders, iPhone reminders, whatever it is. But it's a little more cumbersome because you have to remember. It it is, and um, and it's not a. Well, I don't consider my premiums a bill, but this is not something you want to miss. No, for sure not. Yeah, you, right. I mean, what's going to happen if you miss the the insurance company? Most likely, they're going to take the automatic premium loan and pull from your cash value to pay your premium for you. Uh, but that's not a good situation either. No, it's not. But you know, luckily, they you know, the companies we work with are are, are pretty on top of it, and they they will generate that letter that gets you know that you'll get a copy of and say, hey, this is overdue, and an it, email, which is nice too, and it gets sent to us too. That's right, we get that as well, so we'll, yeah. we so we know. Yep, and then we got to make a phone call. So, you know, it takes time out of my day to babysit you because you're not making your payments. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's what we do. Uh, so what are some other disadvantages of not paying annually? I mean, the most obvious disadvantage if you pay monthly over annual is it's going to cost you more. Yeah. Well, yes. We talked, you know, upcharge, right? Yeah. I mean, to the tune of about 2%. Possibly, you know, upcharge on your total premium to pay monthly. Yeah. You know, I tell people, again, you know, hey, we're going to start where you're at. If you're a monthly guy or gal right out of the gate, hey, that's okay. But over time, you know, I, I'll show them a kind of a side-by-side -side of, the of, of a, you know, in an illustration. I get illustrations, just numbers on a page. But just to give them some perspective of over time, in the early years, hey, we're splitting hairs. But over 40 years of paying premium, there's going to be some difference. Yeah, right. That delta gets larger. It does. No time. question. But just because you pay monthly in the first year, does that mean you always have to pay monthly? No, you can, you know, this is your contract, right? You, the, the company is administering this contract. And if you want to go from being a monthly guy to a semi-annual or quarterly or, or annual, um, you know, you just contact us and we help you facilitate that changeover. Right. And depending on what company you're with, some companies you can change midstream. So you could be monthly and then, you know, three months into your, your year, your policy year, you get, you know, a, a bonus from work or you have a good month, you know, if you're self-employed and you say, Hey, I've got the rest. I want to pay it all off for the remainder of the year. Some companies will allow you to, others won't. Yeah. So I think that's strange. It must be just, you know, they, if I'm a company, I want that premium now. It's more right. I don't know why they wouldn't. Uh, there's probably an I, answer. Somebody knows, but uh, I don't know why they wouldn't accept that. I don't know. Maybe internal bureaucracy stuff. Could be. Could be the tail wagging the dog on this one, and just you know, bureaucracy or just slow to make changes, or the the system can't handle it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think people need to realize sometimes that, you know, these life insurance companies, they're not banks, right, Dave? You know, we're talking about infinite banking, but, you know, they're collecting premium, administering life insurance contracts. Doesn't matter what type of contract it is, right? Um, they're not, you know, Capital One where, you know, they've got this huge wing that does all the tech and all the, you know, all the servers or, you know, it's just, you know, and, you know, creating money out of thin air. They don't, you know, right. life insurance companies can't do that. So, um, they are going to be, you know, slow to react sometimes and slow to change. And, you know, hey, 
that's okay. Just pay my death benefit when, and give me policy loans. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just happy they're, they're keeping costs down by not that's having, right. uh, you know, too much G whiz tech that, that doesn't get that's used. Right. But yeah, I would they're say, lean. yeah, they are lean. They're in fact, yeah, they're very, they're, lean. <laughs> the one that we particularly like is extremely lean. Extremely I got, lean. Which I is... got to see it, uh, firsthand when I was like, Oh, that's how many people work here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Right. So, um, you know, maybe we've added a couple more employees over the years because of uh, the business we brought in. <laughs> um, but we, we definitely keep them busy. Yep. No question. Um, but yeah, they are. But, you know, it, it's still, it's the 21st century. So these life insurance companies are up to speed as far as online payments, online uh, electronic funds transfer for your loans. Um, so you can do all of that online. If you can do online banking, you can do this. It's not confusing. Yeah, this is, is, is quite easy. Yeah, you're not dealing with, you know, writing checks and sending them in and, and all that, unless you want to. Some people choose to. That's fine, too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, well, okay. So, we covered why it costs more to pay monthly. Um, now, what about dividends? So, if I pay monthly, do I get a lower dividend return or does the cash that appears from my dividend, you know, to my cash value at the end of the year, is that lower because I didn't pay my annual premium or does it really make a difference? I think it's going to be this. Well, I can't, I can only speak to the companies that we write for, but I'm, I think it's going to be the same. Yeah. I, I think if there is a difference, it's pretty negligible. Yeah. It's not enough for that to be your, your driving factor in paying annual or monthly. The driving factor is the fact that you're paying less money, less premium, uh, if you pay annually, you know, you're, you're, it's less cash out of pocket. It's less outlay. Um, it's more efficient. For the, right. For the same result, right? For the same result. So right. definitely more Time efficient. value of money. Money is more valuable to the company right now, not over 12 months. Right. Just like it is to you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as it is, it's, you get the same result. You pay upfront annually, you still get access to that capital and the insurance company gets their money quicker. So it's kind of a win-win. And since you're an owner of the insurance company, what's good for the insurance company should be good for me. It definitely is good for you, Dave. Mm -hmm. For sure. You know, that's, I have that conversation a lot, not to change topics, but the whole, the policy loan question, or how do I pay it back? Or how much should I pay back? And I say, listen, um, you're repaying money that you borrowed from a company that you're part owner of I think by giving capital back to that company on a regular basis is beneficial to that company. And therefore, directly, because this company hopefully is going to pay you a dividend, it's going to be, you know, benefit you. And they're administering a policy for you that's going to protect your family. So, right. yeah, it's 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 100% beneficial to you. Yep. Absolutely. Good point. Um, okay. So somebody says when, I don't know if we covered this actually uh, precisely, but when can I decide on which modal premium to choose? How often can I make that decision, Paul? Like, like if I want to go annually or monthly, when yeah. can I make that decision? Well, like, you can, at the beginning of the application process, we're going to discuss that, right? Yeah. And then and after that, after, so every year I can change it. Yeah. Oh yes. If that's what you were asking, sorry. Yeah. You could change it. Yeah. You could change it every, every, as you know, as often as you need to. Some people are going to jump back and forth, but again, I think the goal should be strive toward annual and stay there. Yeah. So yeah, some people, so the question is why, well, Hey, if I'm paying annually, then I need to save up money in somebody else's bank to have it available to pay annually. Oh, right? I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, going on. I've had this yeah. discussion. Yeah. Yeah. So and I tell them, well, that's, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Like the whole idea is to not save money in somebody else's bank. Right. But right. that being said, now what, what about the person who they pay annually and a couple months in, they want to, you know, they, they take a loan against their policy to like, you know, my client here has got to pay a, a bill a truck bill yeah. unexpected or a big emergency and they got to access that cash value loan right away. Now, where should they be saving their money up for next year's payment? 
and they should be filling that hole up and paying paying back that policy loan. Right, right. That should always be the first place you redirect your savings. Absolutely, fill fill that hole back up. I think, again, Dave. I think until people are doing this, they kind of they hear like Nelson says in the book, their brain. They hear loan, their brain shuts down. Like, nope, that's money that's gone. It's not. The money's already there. Yeah. Right. It never left your policy. You're just there's a lien on it. Right. You're just freeing up the money again. So, yes, if you've got a hole, fill it up. Yeah. And people, you know, people have grown very comfortable with, well, I want I want at least two or three thousand dollars in my checking or savings account. So it's there for me. Like, how is that any different? It's still there for you. If you had a, a loan out, you repay that loan. Those dollars are there for you. That's right. Whenever you need them. Right. It may there might take... be just like a, a two week delay, right? Uh for bank clearing operations as loan, you know, the loan payments clear and all that stuff. But short of that, yeah, you can swap yeah. your credit card if you need if you need to or Exactly. Whatever. Right. Is there anything you can't use a credit card for? Um, you know, any any legal activity you can't use a credit card for. You know, I wish I could pay my mortgage with it, but I, I... Boom. That would be nice, huh? Getting all those reward oh. points. Oh my goodness. Yeah, wouldn't awesome. that be cool? Might be a lot more people defaulting on credit card payments and not uh, home loans. I did figure out through one company that we use as military folks, a you know bank, mm -hmm. large bank, Fortune 500 company, that I I'm paying my um, my insurance premiums with my AMX now. Oh, you instead can, of just a draft from your checking account. Yeah, you can do it. Really, I uh, yeah. I've always, it's always been a draft for my checking yep, account. For 20 something years, I've been getting an automatic draft. Yeah. And I was just playing around with it the other day up because I bought the, the CUDA and I was up, you know, just looking at stuff and I was like, mm -hmm. huh, can I pay this car? And you know, like the whole, and sure enough, my, yeah. so all my insurance bill through that company now is, uh, all right. is credit well, card. I learned something new every time I talk to you. Paul. Right. And it's, it's money I have. I just, I, yeah, if I can get whatever it is 500 points a month or something right right because you're going to pay that bill you know i probably from the same account they're drafting from anyway for your your insurance so exactly it's no exactly different. right i'm what am i doing dave i'm just changing the sequence you're changing the sequence and you're floating using somebody else's capital and That's earning right. on it yeah responsibly use credit oh, smartly well, yeah of course yeah. i'm just yep yeah right on all right um so free chicken Free I hate, chicken. I hate when people say that, but that, that's what people say, I guess. You're the only person so. I know that says that, so. Well, know. there was someone that I, anyway, never mind. <laughs> Stupid sayings. Maybe that'll be our closing line. <laughs> we can Free change chicken. it up. Free chicken. <laughs> All right. Uh, what are Rest some other fed. options for how to split up my premium payment? So if I want to pay annually, but let's say, let's say my premium is $20,000. Let's say my base is $10,000. Uh, these are just random made up numbers, folks. Um, what if I got $10,000, but I don't have 20 when my annual premium comes due? What are some options? Yeah. Well, certainly you're going to pay the base premium or right. change the mode of them in that moment back to whatever, some other mode. Right. Right. Um, but let's say you didn't say, I want to stay annual. Well, you would pay your base, let's say. And then, um, if your company allows it, then you would over the next 11 months, you would pay the paid up additions, right? With the. Yeah, cash on, flows that come in or whatever. Yeah, on, on there's no schedule whatsoever. It's just on yeah. your own. Like those paid up additions are optional. Um, so you could pay the base up annually and then spend the rest of the year funding the paid up additions. Yep. However you want to, however you can, just ensure that you get those paid up additions in there before the end of that year. Yep. And I've I've got a client that does that. We designed it the way that we were discussing right before we uh, hit record and. Um, so he's been every month just hitting hitting that PUA, yeah. And uh, yep, very yep. flexible and and they and you know people want flexibility and this this provides it. Yeah, lots of flexibility and even more so with the PUA because what if say year two um, I just pay the base annual base premium and then the the rest of the year I'm just living you know uh, hand to mouth like paycheck to paycheck I don't have any additional capital to to put towards my PUA. Sure. And I don't have the time to wait two weeks for it to show up in cash value to, to borrow again. Like, so I, I go a full year without paying PUA. Year three comes along. I never paid year two PUA. What options do I have? Yeah. Um, well, most companies, uh, at least the ones that we work with, have catch-up provisions. 
you know, written in the contract, right? So if I miss PUA in year two, well, I can make it up in year three, right? Right. Um, and, you know, we, I'm not going to contract specifics, but, you know, very generically, that's how it would work. So if I owed, if you know, I could pay 20000 in PUA that year if I had it. Yep, exactly. So you can catch up and go back a year and, and make up for what you missed and, and kind of be back to where you would be. So very flexible. So that's always the question like, hey, what happens in year three? You know, I, I lose my job or I get a big pay cut or my, you know, my business doesn't do as well. Um, what are my options? Sure. So that's one option. Yep. Delay that PUA until you can make that. That's right. Yeah. But by golly, keep that policy in force. Keep it in force. Because if you, uh, you know, and I'm not telling this to my own clients, but anybody else out there who's got a policy that maybe their uh, whole life policy that they're looking at, maybe uh, it, it's going to lapse because you're not able to make the premium payment. Um, there's, there's an open market for people who will buy life insurance policies. Rest assured, if you ever lap, let your policy lapse, that life insurance company is not canceling that policy. It's being, the premium will be paid by somebody else. That policy is still alive. Yeah, nobody, there, no, there is, nobody realizes that, but it's still yeah, out there. You know, yep, people often, I mean, I think part of the application is, you know, one of the questions, have you ever like, you know, used, sold a policy to a viatical company or, you know, whatever. And people are like, what's that? I'm like, well, let me tell you, there's this whole industry uh, that buys typically um, either either very ill or very old people's old whole life insurance policies mm -hmm. um, for something, um, you know, what at least what the cash value is worth. Right. So right. in between the, you know, the, what the cash value is worth. Right. And then the death benefit obviously is larger than that, let's say, right? Um, so that's what that viatical company is going to receive once that person graduates. Um, but they're basically uh, fronting the money now. Well, well you can just do a policy loan. So I don't know why these people sell their policy. Anyway. Well, they're selling it for more than the cash value. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense, right? So Yes, yes. They could yes. have $100,000 of available cash value or surrender value. And instead of surrendering, maybe some investment company will offer them 120000 Sure. So they they win. They get more cash. So it's it sounds really under the table, like very um, not ethical. But if you if you think through it, and I'm not advising it, I, I'm not involved in these companies whatsoever. Right. If you think through it, it's really a win win for that that you know elder person who's selling their their policy and they're getting more cash than they otherwise would. Maybe they don't have any beneficiaries. They need to leave anything to. Maybe they outlived everybody. Yeah. Um, I, it may so make sense. It may I mean, make probably sense. Probably in a lot of cases it, it does if I can get more than yeah. my cash value. But I just, man, I, I'm going to avoid that at all costs, folks. I tell you that. No, no, you don't want to surrender your your, your policy. Um, so, but there is, I mean, somebody's going to buy that policy up, even if it's a young person. Some, in, you know, bank or investment company is going to buy that policy up because there's a death benefit attached. That death benefit is an asset. That asset can be utilized today yep. so we, we talked about this before bringing that future value to the present and putting it to work so um it's kind of a different topic but just realize there's so much more going on behind the scenes that that we're not even aware of with these policies you know especially participating policies dave that increase in value every year you know when dividends are cleared and the death benefit gets larger the cash value gets larger right um of course these companies are going to pay tax on you know, the difference between the basis and the death benefit, I think, right? Um, they're going to pay, they're going to pay ordinary income tax on, on that gain, which may be, which is likely worth it to them though, right? Because it's probably much larger than what they've got in it. Right. Yeah. So anyway. So yeah, kind of off topic, but you know, it's all part of, all part of the industry. Well, yeah, I'm, I guarantee you, we just taught somebody something. Yeah. I mean, that would have taught me something a year ago. No question. I mean, it's a, it's a, it, these are private contracts and they could be mm -hmm. bought and sold. So, yeah. but, um, that's not something that we, uh, yeah, we're trying to become our own banker here. You can't become your own banker unless you own dividend paying whole life. So, right. There you go. Keep it. <clears throat> um, here's another one. So this isn't necessarily about the modal premiums, but it's, you know, we're talking about the base and the PUA. Um, <laughs> Oftentimes, <I> <laughs> you know, the, the, the typical, I guess, 
I don't know, maybe it's what you see on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, like, hey, here's the difference between base and PUA. The base buys the life insurance, the PUA buys the cash value. Now, why is that not the case? It, it's just, it's a twisting of the actual truth. <laughs> it's a fundamental misunderstanding of what, yes, okay. what, what the, that is, yeah. It's all premium, folks. I don't care if it's base premium, which is required to keep the policy in force every year or every month or whatever. All right, we'll just speak annually here. It does. It is not. It is purchasing a certain amount of death benefit or a face amount of for that policy. The paid up additions portion of the premium. Let's say it's that scenario, Dave, where it was ten thousand base, ten thousand PUA. That paid up additions portion of the premium every year is also buying death benefit, isn't it? Right. It's paid. Exactly. It's, it's death benefit. It's no different than base purchased death benefit. Yeah. The difference is, and this is how I explain it to my clients. I tell them this. If you had a 100% base policy that was a participating or dividend paying, all of the cash value in year one is going to come from the hopefully non-guaranteed but likely dividend that is paid on that policy's anniversary there will be no no guarantee you know on the left side there'll be no just base cash value right until year three right so the early cash value that cash value that's immediately available let's say two weeks 30 days after you pay the premium the pua premium that is where the the pua premium produces the early cash value that's readily available and i think that's a right. better way to explain it yeah i think so too but you're that, it's all buying death benefits so it's all buying death benefit people say that because your cash value can't go up without a death benefit i mean your your death benefit is what the cash value how the cash value is created anyway yeah right? that's right it's what the death benefit's worth right now yeah it's all it, it's what you have it's the part of the death benefit you have access to today. That's right. Tomorrow, you're going to have access to a little bit more because you're that much closer to mortality. And therefore, your cash value has to get a little bit closer to the total death benefit, you know, so that they equal each other by age 121. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's it. So PUA has to purchase death benefit for the cash value to increase. That's right. And it, and and PUA premium, and again, it's going to depend on company on how they've structured their policies for cash value and stuff. And there's some that do it well, and there's some that don't do it well. Um, but the ones that do it well, I like, you know, a long running level term rider um, that is purchased to make sure that the policy does not become a modified endowment contract. That's simple for me to understand. It's simple for the client to understand how that works. Um, so that discussion generally goes very, very smoothly once we kind of iron that out. But um, it's, but folks, it's, it's all premium. Premium purchases death benefit. It's just going to be a little bit different on which kind of death benefit it's purchasing, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. There you go. Cool. Well, I think that's pretty good on modal payments. Also, one thing we did get an email. We wanted to clarify. You used the term graduate. Uh, that oh, means, right. That means die. Die. You, you die. So, I did respond it, to him today. I didn't know you guys. Were okay. Him well, trying, but. yeah, you told me to. And, um, I've got a meeting set up with him this week. Um, but uh, just so you know, like if you read Nelson's book, Becoming Your Own Banker, he talks about graduation. He doesn't call it, he doesn't use retirement. He uses passive income year. He doesn't use the term, you know, die or deceased. It's graduate because, um, you know, he's, he's leaving this for somewhere better. Right. So that's uh, when we say graduate, <laughs> that's what we mean, folks. Yeah, that, so that email had a lot of a lot of questions in it. Hopefully, yeah, that was good. We should probably it's we good. should probably break it out and uh, handle some of them next time. So, well, all right, good one. I guess uh, we'll see you guys next week. Uh, and in the meantime, control your capital, or somebody else will. Hey, thanks for listening, everybody. If you'd like to have a conversation with us to see how you can become your own banker, or if you have any questions or topics you'd like us to tackle on a future episode please send us an email to David and Paul at the ibcguys.com. And subscribe and leave us a review if you're on Apple. Follow and leave us a five-star review if you're on Spotify. And please share this with your friends. We'll see you next week.